All right, welcome everybody. Rob Provence here from OBS Photo Success. Got a couple things I want to share with you guys today. Um, don't you don't you hate it when this happens? You make some notes. I'm a, I'm a note guy. I'm always writing notes down, little post-its, uh, or you know, goals, monthly goals. I'm always writing stuff down. But don't you hate it when you write it down and, and you're like, what was I writing? I can't understand my writing. Uh, so you got to be careful. Clarity clarity is key. So I want to talk to you uh, first things first. You might notice that that big ass umbrella back there. That's a huge umbrella from Palsy Duff. Uh, I forget what model it is, but it was inspired by a friend of mine down in Texas, Jason Abbott, who I met in person back in 1988 at one of the three day inferno workshops we had down in Nashville. And uh, he's been, uh, you know, he almost quit back then. And another member in, sort of motivated him to keep going. And he did. It was a very emotional time. Um, he was very much motivated because of this other person's words and her inspiration and uh, the things that she had to say. This sort of came out in front of the group, uh, some discussion. It was quite, it was like a testimonial of sorts. And he's doing some amazing work. He's just uh, absolutely stunning. So, um, and I've noticed some of his works, images, samples that I've swiped when he uh, posts on Facebook couple images that I really like and in particular uh, I like the black and whites he's been doing so I went out and bought the light that he uses it's a 60 70 inch PLM I think it is and uh, the reason I like that black and white is I 20 years ago I remember I was going it's a black and white with a black background and I remember going through that about 20 years ago I went through like a, I called it my black phase I was doing a lot of black background I, I like that look it's very clean when you have really nice tones in black and white, it looks really, really good. Uh, if it's done right, it's done right. It looks nice. It's very clean. That's sort of the style I like, uh, besides adding some artistic element in Photoshop to some of my images, my portraiture. Um, I really like a nice, clean, well-lit image. So, inspired by Jason, I went ahead and bought the light. Now, buying the equipment doesn't mean, doesn't equal mastery. Ownership does not equal mastery. Now, I know that. So I know that I have to work at sort of uh, not only swiping Jason's look, but I can be inspired by Jason's look and sort of learn from Jason because he's willing to help me. I've already sent him an email and asked him if he would be on an upcoming uh, uh, lighting mastermind. You know, I do these lighting masterminds every month as well as a marketing mastermind every month. So I've already asked him if he would come on board to sort of share the specifics, the techniques as to how he creates his look using that particular light. But I've already been experimenting on my own, so I'm kind of like doing my own thing. The important thing is you can't really just go out and swipe somebody wholesale. You have to sort of be inspired by what they're doing, make it your own. This happens in a virtually every artistic manifestation, music, writing, photography, art, painting, whatever, you know, architecture, anywhere where you're creating, virtually everybody, without exception, has been inspired by somebody at some point in their lives. Now, Jason would probably look at me and go, well, yeah, but you were the master, you're the guy that taught me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. It's like we learn from each other. It's ongoing. Uh, at some point in time, the master learns from the student. The student surpasses the master, and that's totally cool. You cannot let your ego get in the way when it comes to stuff like that. So, now having said that, I want to read you something, and I will uh, give you guys notice as to when this mastermind lighting. Uh, it's June 2016 right now, sometime in June, probably within the next week. Uh, there'll be uh, our usual monthly mastermind lighting, and uh, we'll get Jason on board. Hopefully, Jason. He's agreed to it. He says he's very busy. We may have to wait till July. Anyways, we always have one anyways. So, uh, let me just read you something from brainpickings.org. And brainpickings.org is a uh, it's an awesome website. This girl who runs it sends out a weekly synopsis of classics on philosophy, art, from all kinds of long lost, forgotten works, books, essays, etc, etc. She, she like pours her heart and soul into this. 
and it's quite amazing. And she sends out a weekly summary, and uh, it's quite stunning. I heard of her because Tim Ferriss, you know, Four Hour Work Week. Tim, Tim Ferriss interviewed her, I think, last year, and I was quite smitten by what she had to say. So I went and signed up for her newsletter. Uh, again, brainpickings.org. Check it out. So, anyways, she has a little blurb here. I want to read this for you because it applies to what I'm talking about with Jason. Uh, Walt Whitman. You know Walt Whitman? He was born in 1819, uh, died in 1892. He was 36 years old when he self published Leaves of Grass. Uh, and, it, and he had a, well, I'll just read it for you. This is what she says. Amid its dispiriting initial reception, he received a soul saving letter of encouragement from Emerson, none other than Ralph Waldo Emerson who at that point had become America's most influential literary tastemaker. Whitman carried this particular letter uh, in his pocket for a long time, proudly showing it to friends and lovers and eventually reprinting it in full in the second edition on the spine of which a particular vitalizing sentence from the letter, and I quote, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, end quote, was stamped in gold. Without Emerson's emboldening miss missive, the young poet may have perished in obscurity. Isn't that awesome? So this is sort of uh, ties in with Jason's story where he was ready to quit. He was literally ready to throw in the towel. And another member who had a lot of respect for him, she called him up and said, don't you dare, don't you dare quit. You, you got it going on. That's a good thing he didn't quit because he does have it going on. He's got some good stuff. So, But my big picture point in all of this is how we uh, can use mentors, we can use words of encouragement from other people who help us see the bigger picture and help us see the potential in ourselves. I mean, it's our responsibility to dig deep, to look inwards and say, well, where is it we want to go? What is it we want to do? What is it that inspires us? Who inspires us so that we can sort of swipe some ideas and be inspired by what it is they're creating and eventually create our own particular look, our own particular style? So virtually nobody in any, you know, in any project, in any career of uh, work, whether it be in entrepreneurial or in art, matters not. Virtually everybody has been inspired by somebody else and been motivated. Sometimes it's a parent, a friend, friend of the family, an aunt, an uncle, etc., etc., etc. It's vital to be able to, in our darkest periods, you know, when the world is hating on us big time, uh, which a large part, in my opinion, especially in today's day and age in social media, a large part is sort of like. Uh, well, there's two sides to that coin. Uh, the one side is is that it's in our own imaginations. We blow it out of proportion. And on the other side, uh, there's a lot of haters out there. A lot of people don't want you to succeed. They're jealous. That's just a human thing. So we're open up to that and to those attacks and to those messages much more so in today's day and age than ever before. So it chews away and it erodes at our ego, at our... Uh, well, I don't want to say ego. That's a bad word. I want to say our, uh, our self-esteem, our sense of self-identity. Because when we're trying to create, especially when we are first starting out, especially when we're first starting out in business, um, we're much more vulnerable. We're much more sensitive to these words which come as attacks. So it's nice to be able to look for and receive and be open to words of encouragement, just like what happened to Walt Whitman and what happened to Jason. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, something to keep in mind. All right, onwards. Let's move on to the next topic. Um, <clears throat> I just want to show you something here. There's a prom picture that I shot about a week ago. See that prom picture? Bingo! So. I only want to show you this because not much to do with proms, but more to do with when I'm showing images, uh, I always like to show our clients the end result. So we tell them, you know, only choose pose and expression only. This sort of goes back to the old days when the proofs came back from the lab. If you had a soft focus and a vignette on it, fine, but usually there was no retouching. Obviously, there were proofs. And I know some photographers will work on every single image in the session, and I'd much, much rather poke needles in my eyes than do that. That would drive me nuts. 
a lot of our clients know what to expect. They see the samples on the walls, so it's not a big issue. But I still like to remind, you have to remind them and explain to them over and over and over again. So we do this by showing a lot of images. So we've got this one here. This is straight out of the camera. It's probably a bad example because she looks really good without retouching. You know, so I, I've got samples of older people with lines like me. But here's what I wanted to show you. See, there's the after shot. And you can see how, see how this is before, and I've added a texture, and I've added some retouching. And then, this one here is a painted version. So painting is something we're really going into. And as you can tell, it's got that sort of thing going on with the painterly effect. So. But the whole idea has to do with explaining and educating and managing your client's expectations. Here's another example from the same shoot. Okay, let me just show you something here. This was shot on this background. Okay, I added this. This is sort of a bokeh texture screen. I added it. And I thought it was an appropriate thing to, uh, sort of an appropriate look to look to use for that particular a particular image. A big inspiration for that is uh, Maggie. Maggie Hedietta from uh, Oakville, who's uh, one of the judges on our monthly bullpen print show competitions. And I've had, I've got a whole series with her in the No BS Photo Success Forum. And in the final part of that series, she shows her workflow and she uses a lot of textures and she explains how she chooses and which ones make sense and some don't make sense. You got to be very careful. Uh, same idea. Twins, by the way. This is their prom dresses. Okay, and here I added a texture. They really like this one. The mom didn't like the pose because the girl's standing on the couch, but the girls liked the standing on the couch. They thought it was cool. So, anyways, I convinced the mom to listen to the girls, and that's the one they picked. So, same idea, same idea, prom. This was shot against my brick backdrop. And I really thought, you know what? Let's use that. This is a texture screen I bought from Heather the Painter. I follow her, I get her emails. She had a sale on a series of, uh, I guess you want to call them canvas backdrop texture screens, old masters. She had about 30 of them on sale for, for like 100 bucks. Uh, you'll have to Google her. I, uh, I bought them and they're in my collection. So I started using them. And I like that particular backdrop because it just, as you can tell, goes well with the dress. All right, what else do we have? Uh, here's a question for you. Can you still succeed in a bricks and mortar studio? I believe you can. You know, I keep a close, close eye on the industry. Um, I'm, I've been asked to speak at an all-day uh, convention next October. And I'm told that the majority of the attendees will be newbies. Now that's changed a lot from back in the old days, as you may or may not know. Um, back when I was uh, starting out for 20 years, there was about 12 or so full-time photography studios. They're all gone. They're all gone. There's newbies everywhere or part-timers. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not complaining about that. It is what it is. For cultural reasons and or economic reasons, these things might be happening. And I keep an eye on it because if it happens, whatever. I'm still going to do photography at some level. And I do have a full-time studio. Actually, we just moved recently, about eight months ago. And we're still renovating this studio uh, that we moved into. So it's pretty exciting, actually. New signage. You know, and I, I talked about the signs and the importance of a good sign in last month's marketing mastermind. You can watch the replay from members. But uh, I believe uh, you can still make a go. And I track and follow and keep in touch with photographers who are constantly successful. You know, Maggie's one of them. John Ratchford is another one. Uh, Warren Noyce is another one. These are people that are running full-time studios. And, uh, you know, uh, Sandy Pooch down in Colorado, etc. There's There's a lot of them. Not as many as there used to be. So if you come to me and say, well, can you make it? Or if you come to me and you say, you can't make it, I'm going to say, no, you can make it. It's just not like it was in the old days. And what's the big difference? The big difference, in my opinion, is marketing. Marketing, as usual, is, is the thing. You have to really stand out. That's the big marketing solution. 
and question and direction. You have to really stand out and make a difference in the client's eye. Plus, you have to manage their expectations more than ever. For example, they, if they come to you with the expectation that you're going to shoot for 100 bucks or 200 bucks, and they get all the digital files, that is a bad, bad idea. That is not a model to sustain a long-term photography business. Um, so if you're doing that now, stop it. Rip the Band-Aid off, stop it. Uh, so you have to, you know, and usually when people come to you with that particular mindset, it's because they don't know any better. So it's up to you to explain to them. So it's important to have a nice studio, have a nice personality, to be well-dressed, to have really good products, uh, to have a pleasant personality. So when they come into your studio, when they meet you, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If they meet you in your basement and it smells like salami sandwiches and you got, you know, an old t-shirt on, no. You know, then it's going to be, well, 100 bucks, all the digital files. But if they come into your place of business, even if you're operating from your home, you have to do everything you can to create that, whoa, wow, this is, this is, this is, wow, this is quality. It's going to cost me some money. So you have to create that on all fronts. You have to perpetuate that message continuously in all your marketing, and you have to show up day after day, month after month, year after year, so that people are ingrained in their minds that who you are is who you are, so that they have expectations. It's harder at first, gets easier with time. Never, 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 never take it for granted. Never rest on your laurels because they will become wreaths. So you have to continuously keep at this. And to me, it's exciting. It's really exciting because. Uh, it's uh, you never want to get stale or rusty or you know kind of get stuck in the mud. So yeah, that's important, and that's the solution. So when people ask us about digital files, my wife uh, does the management of the studio, um, and it's just like uh, no, we only sell prints and albums, and for and we get onto the topic of wall decor. You know, we sell wall portraits like that one right there, uh, canvases, and they can see it. They look around our studio, they can see it. And they go, oh, okay. And, and we explain how we put a lot of work into creating something that is unique and artistic for, of their particular memory. So it's not as easy as it used to be. I'll, I'll admit that. But it's totally possible. Um, all right. What else do I want to talk about? Uh, one final item. And then a quick news item. Then I'm on. Uh, the, worst, the worst time to try and sell uh, is, when, is when you need the money. Um, let me explain. So if you're, you're in uh, a state of desperation, that's a, a bad place to be. So if you really need the money, you might have overextended yourself or done something to get yourself in that situation. So the first order of the day, if that happens, is to get out of that situation where you don't need the money. Even if you start saving a little bit, even if you start working towards minimizing your debt load, you know, don't go creating a whole pile of debt to buy equipment because equipment, no matter what it is you buy, no matter what workshops you invest in, are not on par with mastery, like I mentioned earlier. Ownership is not mastery. Mastery is mastery. Master yourself first and start from there and get yourself in a good headspace so that when you go to sell, people can sense that you're legitimate. You know, even if you got a hundred bucks in the bank and that's it, that's better than having a six thousand dollar credit card debt or a loan, which is going to drag you down and it's really hard to pull out of that. Even at a subconscious level, you you radiate that sort of mentality, that culture, that mindset. I talk about this a lot in other uh, webinars I've had on wealth management and prosperity mindset for photographers. So I'm not going to get into it in a big way, but I just want to mention and highlight the idea that the best time to sell is when you're in a proper mindset. It's much easier to sell. You feel good about where you're at. You have, you know, you don't have anything dragging you down, down financially. So don't avoid debt. Debt is bad. I think that's it. Let me uh, talk about one more thing. This is a point and shoot camera. It's a Canon G12. It was, I think, my fourth or third point-and-shoot camera. The first point-and-shoot camera I ever bought was in 2002 with James Hodgins. We were uh, speaking at Henry's three-day convention in Toronto, and they had a bunch of stuff for sale. There was uh, 
counters and product. So we spoke at one of the seminar rooms and then we were looking at some of the stuff and the Canon A72, I think it was, which was like a three megapixel camera or two and a half, just a point shoot. This is going back a long time ago. So he says, I'm gonna buy one for my wife. So he buys one for his wife, Jocelyn, and uh, puts it in the bag and when we were done, we left and it was Friday night, we went out for supper. And while we were having supper, he brought the camera in with him and he, he can't help himself. He just had to open it up, put it together, start taking pictures. And it was like, wow, this is fun. So the next day, I went and bought myself one and his wife never did get that camera. He kept it for himself. I think he eventually bought her one. But uh, we realized the power of the point and shoot camera. To me, the point and shoot camera is one of the most important cameras you can purchase. And I'm going to be making a video on that next week, uh, showing why, explaining why, and uh, we'll be posting that on, uh, on this uh, podcast, YouTube stuff. Okay. If you have any questions for me, please email me, rob at wizardoflight.com, rob at wizardoflight.com, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, guys, thanks.